Hello again, everybody. Hope you had a great time in the uh, sessions that we just concluded. Coming up next is a dive into the history of the web with Brian Cardell and Chris Wilson. We've all been working on the web for a long time, but not all of us have been around for that long. So this should hopefully be a really informative and fun dive into just what our past was. Thank you. All right, hi, uh, this is the third Blink On Web History Talk. Uh, it's actually the fourth Web History Talk in a way though, because uh, the first one was a long form uh, like lecture style talk that was given at Chrome University by uh, Chris Wilson. It's a great talk, we'll link to it. And we'll try not to cover too much stuff that's in there, but I am joined here today with Chris Wilson. Hi, uh, thanks Brian. Chris, you were, uh, You've been involved with the web since like the very, very beginning. You worked on like the first popular web browser, Mosaic. Pretty much, yeah. Yeah, I started working on the web in 1993. Um, I was working at NCSA doing other projects. I was kind of the lead for the, the PC software. Um, and we started working on NCSA Mosaic not that long after the, the X Windows version got started. I think probably a lot of people who are listening don't really know what NCSA is <laughs> like. So can you give like a maybe oh, 10, yeah. 10 to 30 second answer? to Yeah. That? So NCSA stands for the National Center for Supercomputing Applications. Uh, and basically, the University of Illinois through NCSA was one of the National Science Foundation. Uh, I forget what they were like um, funded sites, basically. And uh, they had several supercomputers. And the group that I was in there, uh, we, were, we were the software tools group. And our charter was basically to build tools that um, regular researchers, uh, academic people and everything, they could use to access the power of the supercomputer from the desktops that they probably had, like PCs, Macs, X Windows workstations. So like the first thing I was hired to work on as an undergrad was Telnet for DOS. Because like literally DOS didn't have a network package. It didn't have Telnet. It didn't have the terminal program built in. You had to go like buy it or get soft free, free software to do it. And that's what I worked on was that free software. Yeah, this is like probably like, I, I have difficulty like imagining what it's like, like living in another timeline where I'm born like 10 years later or something <laughs> like that. Because it must, like, it must be really hard to relate to, but um, like, there, there was not really Windows. <laughs> um, not really. I mean, at that point, we had like Windows 3.11 was the Windows for Workgroups was the mm -hmm. current version. And I mean, the key here was like you still, even in Windows, until Windows 95, you did not have a TCP IP package built into right. Windows. So like, you know, the next project that I worked on, or one of the projects that I worked on before Mosaic was Telnet for Windows. And we had to port the entire network package, like literally the device drivers for hardware network cards in order to um, to get it up and running. Like we didn't have a, a sockets library to build on. We wrote the sockets library. Lots, lots, and a very tiny percentage of American homes. And I think America was like way up on the curve compared to the rest yes. of the world um, had computers at all, right? Yes. And a, a shocking percentage of those, it, you know, like, it's not shocking, but uh, you wouldn't think about it. Like, even though Windows was out, it's, it's a very strong likelihood that even if you had a computer, it didn't have Windows, right? Or and then didn't have a current version, or you didn't use it much. I mean, certainly you didn't game from within Windows. You probably didn't game on your, your desktop computer at all. But, you know, Windows was like something that people were just starting to use. And how many of those people then also had a modem like it, well, that was an optional thing yes uh, it was pretty optional <laughs> for quite and, then, a while. and then how many of those people could like figure out how to use a web browser like it was a pretty it was a pretty niche thing when it started out right like you oh, had yeah. to know a lot to you had, you had to fall into a relatively small niche to be a early person on the web and you were at ncsa just sort of like right in the hub where you could 
uh, oh, I was absolutely in the right place at the right time. I mean, it, it was great to be there in kind of the middle of it all and see. I mean, I, I kind of grew into this whole network and, and internet and web at, yeah. the, at the, not at the very beginning of the internet, but at the very beginning inflection point where you started getting content and other people connected. And that was when it really started getting interesting. And so what's really interesting is at that time, like the network protocols were like, there were a lot of them that were competing and like, it wasn't even unique. Some of the things that the web did. Right. So in 1991, Sir Tim Berners Lee released his, he wasn't a sir yet, uh, <laughs> released his, uh, browser on next step, which was a really cool operating system that most people don't know. Um, but it like. His idea was in a lot of ways, like very simple and lesser than many other things that already existed. Um, like it had a lot of challenges, right? Oh yeah. I mean, I think he made some interesting choices um, in the underlying syntax and things like that. Um, but he really, he made the source as easy to understand as possible, as human readable and writable as possible, and realized very early on that hyperlinking was really the biggest, most important piece to, um, to, to, to the whole puzzle of getting people hooked in. And he made the software so easy to, to build that you could easily run a web server, you could easily run a web browser, and um, it wasn't, he didn't try to envision this is the piece of software everyone will use to access this this thing. He set it up so that other people could go build that software too. Could you tell me, like, uh, like how closely could you have predicted that the web would be the thing that it is today? Back then, like, did you did you imagine? <laughs> I don't think any of us really imagined what the web would be today. Like th this is so many layers removed from that. I think we all had a strong belief that it was um, it was a super useful tool. Like a really, it was going to be an absolute game changer. Like not even a game changer, a completely different game from then on in computing because it opened up all of this uh this accessibility of of content of information and and i went into this in my talk a little bit but it, it's impossible to really understand how different the world was before yeah. that i mean like even if you could see the potential for it it was what's interesting about it is that the web was like very much an underdog in this right like it was it was very like i say niche and sort of academic and it didn't really have like the big business bets behind it. It didn't have like it, like Gopher was like in the library systems at this point, like pretty much mm -hmm. like every library that I went to was like on that. Uh, but you also had like high time. There was a lot of buzz around high time. Like high time was gonna be the, you know, the real thing uh, that had like Ted Nelson involved in it. And I think uh, Goldfarb, uh, it, you know, there were SGML ISO standards at that point. And it just looked like a lot of things about the web seemed like academic and a little bit almost like a cute toy because of the simplicity. I think it's the interesting bit is there was also this massive watershed that happened as bandwidth became more and more available and easier to come by and, and memory and computing power became easier and cheaper and more common to come by. I mean, I, I ran across something uh, the other day that was uh, an, an old ad for a computer, uh, the Raytheon 704, that was released the year I was born. And I mean, keep in mind, this is not like a personal computer. This is like a yeah. corporate level, you know, $70,000 in today's dollar computer and uh, ran at one megahertz and had eight kilobits of kilobytes of memory in it nice. total. Nice. And I mean, even if you think about when I was in college and when I was working at NCSA, the power that you could get out of the supercomputer at that point, I have that in my cell phone. 
I don't even have the latest and greatest cell phone, right? Like, but it's just the the amount of memory and, you know, we all watch streaming video today. And I remember a point in my career programming that there was this, uh, it was going around basically like, oh, well, we can never get that many bits uh, displayed on the, the video bus that fast. Like we can't animate full screen video in full color because it's just too much too much bandwidth right. and it's like well wait a while and those things will happen and i think now we're at this inflection point of well what can we do with more power or should we do and hopefully we'll start answering that question more so maybe one of the webs maybe some of the webs sort of initial weakness was actually a strength because uh it allowed a lot of people to get in and help envision its future Mm -hmm. Right. So that I feel like is kind of what happened with Mosaic, right? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, to be clear, like this, the team working on Mosaic, we weren't uh, the most seasoned software engineering superstars at the time. Like we we're largely college students, you know, like a few grad students. Most of us had either just graduated or were still undergrads. And um, that like we went and built the code that, that kicked this whole thing off. I mean, I actually, uh, I looked back at, at, you know, that part of the code and I didn't have a manual. I didn't have like, I, I couldn't go look up on the internet how to write code to do a rendering layout yeah. engine or anything like that. So I made it up, right? And I actually, when I uh, eventually went to Microsoft and started using the Spyglass code, which was, was uh, based on the NCSA mosaic code, like I could still see the uh, the design that I had that I'd originally put into NCSA mosaic for Windows, because there was a very specific bug in the way that it worked. Mm -hmm. And I knew it was a like, it was a shortcoming, but I was like, ah, I'll fix that later, <laughs> and never did. And, you know, you just, you see how those, uh, those effects happen over time. What's interesting is Mosaic was available on three operating systems, right? Mm -hmm. So were they, they were not the same team though. They were not the same team and most definitely not the same source code. Yeah. Like, I think we all started from Tim's libw3 to do like the parsing of HTTP requests and uh, the basic parsing of HTML, but then we just hacked the heck out of them. I mean, at the time we were in 16-bit Windows and 16-bit um, Mac op operating system. And it was just um, like, it, it was, they were so different in how you had to do things like manage memory uh, that it would have been difficult, not impossible, but difficult to have shared code. And there wasn't enough impetus to actually do that because it was so visual. Right, and not visual in a, okay, now you have to display the pixels way, but in a, okay, you need to scroll windows. How does that work on Mac versus windows or, or the like? And it was pretty, pretty wild. So uh, Mosaic kind of made uh, the web popular enough that uh, like a lot more people could try it. It like, it got written about a lot um, mm -hmm. <clears throat> and then uh, it's kind of split up, like a lot of the people left to go other places. Um, <laughs> you went to, uh, Spry, right? Which was, yeah. So I was actually kind of looking to, um, to move on. I was getting married and my wife wanted to go to grad school and we decided we wanted to move out to Seattle. And I connected with this company that was licensing the mosaic source code Spry. And so I, I um, left NCSA, like gave, in, gave my notice. And I think this kind of uh, lit a fire under Mark Andreessen, who'd already left NCSA at the time and was talking with Jim Clark um, about uh, starting this company, you know, that became Netscape. And um, they basically came back and interviewed most of the rest of the mosaic development team and kind of scoop them all up all at once yeah. and uh and then i only stayed at spry for a little over a year i think 
before I moved to Microsoft. I feel like the generation of things like, so for anybody who doesn't know, um, Spry made a thing that was internet in a box. Oh, yes. Um, I, I have oh, you have it. Mosaic have in a it box right, there. right here. Okay. Yeah. There was uh, a bigger product that was internet in a box and had all of the, you know, telnet and email and everything. We had all the clients because yeah. it, it wasn't clear at the time that Mosaic, that the web was the winner. Right. So like literally, we had an email client, an FTP client, a gopher client. And when I was working on the team, like there was another one of my peers working on the gopher client. Like we were investing in it just as much as the web browser. An interesting like anecdote to this is uh, this is about the time that I personally came to the web. Uh, I learned about the web in a bookstore <laughs> um, because, well, there wasn't a web to learn about the web on. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> and I immediately bought a bunch of books. Um, and one of them was uh, an early book written by some Fortune 500 consultant, you know, whatever. Um, and in it, he talks about how uh, Netscape, this brand new startup, like they just cornered the market and like Bill Gates lost, like it's over. Um, that's pretty, that's pretty interesting because then you went to work for Microsoft. Yes. Uh, and you worked on, was it IE3 was the time you came in or IE2? So I actually joined the IE team. I actually went to Microsoft and started on a different project altogether. Uh, when I first went there, I was working on, it was basically a distant forerunner of Bing search. Um, okay. I wrote a, I wrote a web crawler for them. Basically it was the only thing that I did there, but it was fascinating because I had to like crawl office content, which was neat. Um, but then, uh, the IE team found out that I, that somebody with a lot of browser experience was there and they came over and poached me, which was an interesting, <laughs> cause I, I, at that point I was like, yeah, I kind of want to get back into the browser stuff. I, I missed that. And um, yeah, it was, I, I made some not so good friends there by, by jumping ship, but, um, but I joined shortly before we shipped IE 2.0. I did one check-in in IE 2.0 and then really got going in IE 3. I feel like um, since we're speaking at a Google event, uh, it feels a little weird to say this, but it is very hard to appreciate how different the web was before Google. <laughs> <laughs> um, like search engines were much less. Oh yes. And finding anything on the web was very, very difficult and frustrating. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, so. A, a good example is actually, um, the, the search engine that I was working on, we basically, we, we got, uh, the database, the index, um, we licensed it from Lycos, which was another early mm -hmm. web search engine and then microsoft like put the content on their own database back end because they thought their their database was just that much better and people would use it more um and the interesting bit was we got a new copy of the database once a week wow like do you do you remember the like it was only updated once a week <laughs> you'd have like uh the search engines like alta vista and you like there was like you know we imagine oh, yeah. you would have 47 input fields where you would like be like, I know who the author is. And, you know, like it was very much like trying to apply library science somehow to pretty close. Yeah. But uh, it was very interesting. Like that should do a, like a whole podcast about that at some point or something. But uh, so anyway, you went to Microsoft and uh, many of your coworkers went to Netscape. Uh, yeah. And you made I mean, competing engines. Yes, I think part of that was, you know, I I had actually already made the commitment to move to Seattle at the time. Um, and uh, I liked living in Seattle once I was there. And when I left Spry, I really didn't, like Netscape was doing some interesting things, but there was definitely a, a strong attitude to them as well. And not one that I'd been super fond of when I worked with, a lot of the same people, um, not all of them. Like this isn't, you know, a generic 
statement on people, but I kind of wanted to try something new. And uh, that's kind of how I ended up at Microsoft. Um, it was more, you know, I was looking for a job and wanted to, to move on. And I think that um, it ended up being an interesting dichotomy because like we were talking about this earlier, um, we were, you know, we, we were competing, like our companies definitely were strongly competing, but the people who were working on this stuff, we were collaborating too. Like we were trying to build this platform together to some degree. And there was more positioning, I think, than there is today about, you know, we would come up with some new feature and we would build it and then we would ship it and then we would propose it in a working group or something. And that's not the kind of thing that's okay to do today, certainly. Um, I think we've gotten away from that, which is good. Yeah, that's an interesting thing that I actually wanted to ask you about was like, we, I think the browser wars was uh, was a thing. And uh, for oh, yeah. developers, uh, like it was simultaneously really exciting and really, really frustrating. <laughs> so yeah. like you could do amazing things as long as you only wanted to serve as one browser. Um, Absolutely. And, and kind of actually either browser you could build amazing things with really. Um, you just would have to do it very, very differently. And you could do a little bit more over here than you could do over there on one thing, but not on the other thing. And it was, it was very, it was unfun in a lot of ways. Um, yes. But uh, I, six was at the time it was released like undoubtedly the best browser yeah like, it, it was hands down uh better um before trying to think like er, early browsers before it might have been before ie6 uh like there were no like dev tools <laughs> i think like vankman on mozilla was the first one i ever used yeah, I think that's definitely in the lead for real developer tools. Yeah. Um, so browsers have like come a long way. They've gotten much more complex. And like somehow we did this like through standardization. And there's this interesting thing that's like you said, we would say simultaneously, like you are a veteran of the browser wars. <laughs> Like we, we say the browser wars happened and we say IE6 won the browser wars, right? Uh, but uh, at the same time, it's almost like all the people are fighting for the same thing. And they're really friendly too with each other, right? Usually, yeah. yeah. I think there's like a lot of camaraderie and, and like encouragement among. Uh, absolutely. I mean, I think that the vast majority of people that I've worked with uh, or or worked uh, in concert with from other other companies, even when we're competitors, we largely want to see the web move forward, right? Like that's that's the shared goal. I mean, that's why I moved from Microsoft to Google was because I felt like I could do more moving the web forward at at Google than I could at Microsoft. And I think that there's a lot. Um, there, there's a lot to this analogy of a browser war, because to me, one of the biggest challenges with this, this war analogy is uh, you just conquer everything, right? And the problem is really, and this is what happened with IE6, what do you do once you've conquered everything? And as I said, people are generally friendly and working toward the same things. Um, I'm wondering, like, if, um, like, are there things that we learned along the way uh, that have helped us get better at avoiding the winner loser scenarios? Um, and to this point, I would ask, uh, there is an interesting tradition in browsers that involves <laughs> cakes. Um, yeah. And I'm wondering if you could tell me a little bit about that. And uh, maybe, well, that's the, maybe that's the answer is we just send cakes and- Yeah, just send cakes. Send cake. It you know, it can't go wrong. Um, I mean, I think from very early days, there was a lot of, uh, let's say playfulness about the competition. Uh, I remember, I think it was IE3 release 
party they they held like a release event it might have been ie4 but i think it was ie3 they held a release event down in um down in mountain view or the bay area somewhere and as they had this giant ie logo that they they'd created at the launch event and some of the uh the leadership of the team who were down there at the event i was just you know lowly engineer on the team thought it would be uh funny they packed up this giant logo, you know, like eight feet, 10 feet tall. I don't know how big it was, but it was bigger than a person. They loaded it onto the back of a flatbed in the middle of the night and took it over and dumped it on Mozilla's doorstep. And then, you know, there was all the news stories the next day, you know, Mozilla actually took it in good, good fun. It was, it was funny, but this turned into, I think this tradition of sending, uh, sending cakes every time a browser did a new release and like we got a cake when ie finally delivered ie7 we got a cake uh the ie team started sending cakes to to firefox and and the like and uh obviously at some point this broke down i mean we ship a new version of chrome once every every few weeks now it feels like chris this was it's always fun to talk to you um i i really like these topics and uh you know, hope we can do more of them. It's always fun. Thanks for Likewise. joining me. Thanks so much for having me.